Hello, welcome. Today's webinar, New York Paid Family Leave Update, Basic Requirements and Recent Developments will get started in just a few minutes. We've just opened up the uh, room for attendees to start signing in. So I will allow a couple minutes for everyone to get signed in and then we will get started. Thanks for joining me today for this presentation. You should have the cover slide on the screen, New York Paid Family Leave Update, and you should have access to a chat window where you can type in your questions or comments as we go through the presentation. I'll give more uh, directions on all of that as we get started in just a couple of minutes, but just wanna make sure everyone has a chance to get logged in first. I am Scott Horton. I will be presenting today's webinar in just a couple of minutes. We do have a large number of attendees and people are still joining. So I will probably wait another minute or two to give everyone an opportunity to get logged in and then we will get started. I uh, hope everyone has been able to log in successfully. You should, in addition to hearing me, see the cover slide, New York Paid Family Leave Update, and then find the chat function so that you can type in questions as you have them during the presentation. Just gonna wait maybe 30 more seconds and get started with some of the logistics and then go into the presentation momentarily. Okay, I'm sure a couple more people will still be logging in to join us, but let me just get started. The presentation today, New York Paid Family Leave Update, Basic Requirements and Recent Developments um, is one that I'm happy to present. I am Scott Horton with Horton Law PLLC in Orchard Park, New York, near Buffalo. Uh, many of you are in this area of Western New York, but of course the New York Paid Family Leave program applies statewide and all of the information that I'm providing is generally applicable for New York employees with coverage limits and exceptions that we will talk about towards the beginning of the program. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat window as you have them so you don't forget. If by chance I see one and can work in the answer as we go, I will do that. Otherwise, I will have a question and answer segment at the end of today's presentation, which is scheduled for about one hour. I will stay on to answer all questions that come in that I'm able to answer. And if you have any specific questions about your organization, just be careful not to um, identify a specific situation too carefully. There's no attorney-client privilege in this forum, if there's something more sensitive that you need to discuss with me or another 
employment attorney, then you might want to do that offline. But questions of a general nature, I am more than happy to answer by the end of today's presentation. You will receive a link to the slides at the end. Um, there you go. I was just saying that as a question about that popped up. So yes, you'll get the question, the slides at the end today. And if you are registered, which you are, if you're watching this live as it happens, then you will receive an email by tomorrow with a link to the slides as well. So you don't have to wait um, to download them at the end if you can't wait to the very end today or you just don't need them and you will wait and get the email. That is fine too. So getting into today's presentation, I know most of you probably have a understanding of what New York Paid Family Leave Program is, but I thought it'd be helpful just to start with the basic benefits to employees that the program provides. What are those? Well, basically it's paid time off up to certain limits that include job protection. So similar to the Federal Family Medical Leave Act, although that's unpaid, the New York Paid Family Leave Program um, generally requires that employers keep the job open after the person's leave expires for them to return to work at that time. And uh, another significant component of New York paid family leave, similar again to the FMLA, is that employees are entitled to continue their health insurance during their paid leave on the same terms and conditions that would generally apply if they were actively working. So I've already alluded to twice, I think, the comparison between New York paid family leave program and the federal Family and Medical Leave Act. That is a topic that will keep coming back up throughout the presentation. If you have fewer than 50 employees, you may not be subject to the federal FMLA statute, but you may nonetheless very well be subject to New York's paid family leave program. If you are a larger company, then you would be subject to the FMLA and you could also be subject to New York's paid family leave program. So there are then issues that arise with how the two programs interact, which we will address in some detail toward the latter part of this presentation, but I will also comment on as issues pop up throughout. Again, fundamentally, the main difference between the two programs is New York program provides um, partial wage replacement to employees, where the federal FMLA statute only guarantees paid leave. Uh, specifically, the paid family leave benefits are that the employee will receive 67% or essentially two thirds of their average weekly wage. So an employee who makes $900 a week would receive roughly $600 in paid family leave benefits. That number is capped at 67% of the current New York State average weekly wage, which is currently $1,688.19. So if you have an employee who makes more than $1688.19 per week, then their maximum benefit would be $1,131.08. That is the most the paid family leave program will provide for a week of leave. Employees get up to 12 weeks per year and they can take those in daily increments and they can take them consecutively or intermittently. And I'll, I'll touch on that a couple of times later on. But this 12 weeks per year, of course, is the same number of weeks allowed under the FMLA. Again, the difference, of course, being that none of these monetary benefits are given by the federal law. In many cases, if employees are subject to both the paid family leave 
program and the FMLA, then those 12 weeks would run consecutively, but there are any number of reasons, and some we'll talk about further, why there might not be perfect overlap of the two leaves. Um, and, uh, you know, so it is possible that you will have to administer both separately, but when possible, most employers would try to run the two leaves at the same time. Talking about that maximum weekly benefit, again, this is currently 67% of New York's average weekly wage. That's a number that's determined each year, both the average weekly wage and then whatever the 67% of that would be. Here, I just thought it'd be interesting to see the chart of where the maximum weekly benefit has been since paid family leave came into place back in 2018. So you can see we're now essentially double the original maximum weekly benefit. Um, there's two factors for that. One, the average weekly wage has gone up every year. And two, the original uh, maximum weekly benefit was not 67% of the average weekly wage. Um, I believe it was only 50% of the average weekly wage. So there were jumps in the first couple of years driven by the increase in the percentage, but now we're locked in unless the legislature amends the statute at 67% per, 67% uh, of the average weekly wage. So as long as the average weekly wage across New York state continues to go up, the maximum weekly benefit would be going up as well. Okay, so I wanted to start with that to just make sure everybody understands what this means. People are going out of work and they're getting paid something. It's an insurance benefit, as you probably know. So employers um, obtain insurance coverage or conceivably could be self-insured and it's through the disability benefits insurance uh, that employers in New York also generally must have. There are a couple of exceptions of who must have those insurances and who must participate in the paid family leave program. So that's what I wanted to touch on next, just to make sure everyone is properly oriented in that respect. So who are the covered employers under the paid family leave program? Well, it's all private companies in New York, which generally includes anything that's not a government entity. So when I say private, it doesn't just mean privately held versus publicly traded. Um, it's a non-government entity. And that's what I mean by private. It can and does include nonprofit organizations, although there are some particular carve outs for certain employees of nonprofit organizations, which I will mention in a minute. Public, uh, Entities, so governmental subdivisions, the state of New York, cities, towns, villages, counties, um, public school districts, and public authorities generally were not covered, or at least that is to say they weren't mandatorily subject to the paid family leave program when it came into effect back in 2018. There was and is the possibility to opt in to the program. Uh, that's something that could be agreed to with a union. Um, at this point in time, if you're a public entity that is not already opted into the paid family leave program, it's probably unlikely that you're going to. Um, not many did in the first place, but it is possible if you work for a government entity that this information could be relevant to you, um, but it is also possible that if you're in that sector, then this paid family leave program is just not applicable. Otherwise, if you are a private employer, again, whether for-profit or not-for-profit with employees in New York State, then this information should be relevant and important for you. Now, assuming you are a covered employer, which of your employees are covered by the paid family leave program? Uh, it, it's any employees generally, whether they're full-time, part-time, or seasonal, or 
any other status that you can think of as long as they are an employee. So independent contractors, genuine independent contractors, that is, are not covered. And then once the person is an employee of some description, then they have to meet certain uh, length of service requirements before they would become eligible for paid family leave. For full-time employees, which is a pretty broad category under this law um, of anyone whose regular schedule is 20 or more hours per week, those employees would become eligible for paid family leave after 26 weeks, essentially half a year of consecutive employment. So again, whether you work 20 hours a week or 40 or 50 hours a week, you have to work 26 weeks before you are covered. Part-time employees, which is simply just anyone who doesn't work 20 hours per week on average, that they become covered, again, regardless of how many hours they work per day, week, or what have you, once they've been employed for 175 days, and those 175 days don't need to be consecutive. Um, obviously, most people wouldn't work 175 days in a row, including weekends and the like. Anyway, what this is really referring to is a situation where you have seasonal employees, for example, people that only work over the summer, they wouldn't work 175 days necessarily, or they wouldn't be employed for 175 day period in one summer, but over the course of a couple of summers, they might hit that number of days. And at that point, they would become eligible. Obviously, there's some more nuance in calculating what their regular schedule is, how many hours they work, and you know which period count towards the 175 days. Um, but you know, for this purpose, those are the general parameters. And as I mentioned before, some nonprofit employees are excluded or at least potentially excluded. Here's that list for those of you who might be in the nonprofit world. Again, these people could be covered, um, but by default, they're not um, eligible under the paid family leave statute. So clergy, performing religious duties, people engaged in a professional or teaching capacity for a religious, charitable, or educational nonprofit organization. Um, and that's probably the one that in some cases is the largest group. So private nonprofit um, teaching institutions would exclude a relatively large percentage of their staff in some cases. Again, those people could be covered, just not by default. Uh, compensated executive officers of nonprofit corporations, if again, they're registered as religious, charitable, or educational organizations, and then certain persons that receive charitable aid from a religious or charitable institution to perform work in return for such aid. So I don't want to go into all of that in too much detail by now. We are over five years into paid family leave. If you are one of these organizations or let's say you work with one of these organizations, then you will probably already know what your coverage status is, either because you're just covering everybody by default or you've dealt with these exclusions in particular. But if for some reason, um, those are not the circumstances you're facing, then I just want to make sure you are generally aware um, of these potential exclusions. Uh, obviously, this uh, out of state issue is taking on increased significance in the past couple of years with proliferation of remote work following the COVID pandemic. So I thought it was important to touch on this. Employers with one or more employees in New York State for 30 or more days in a calendar year must obtain disability and paid family leave coverages for those employees. And I have worked with employers outside of New York State, that is say they're physically located outside of New York State, who have hired one or more people who work typically from home within New York State. Um, those individuals 
are subject to paid family leave, assuming some other exception doesn't apply. And there are cases that I have seen where New York State will find out that you have employees working remotely within New York State and require you to make sure they are covered by both disability and paid family leave coverage. Again, just to clarify the disability, um, short-term disability insurance coverage has been required in New York State for much longer than paid family leave. The disability requirement is in the New York workers' compensation law and the paid family leave requirements are also in the workers' compensation law and are specifically a subset, if you will, of the disability um, coverages. So your disability benefit policy is probably separate from your workers' comp policy, but your paid family leave insurance is a rider on your disability policy. Uh, we'll get a little bit more back to what that insurance piece means a little later on, but again, I just wanted to hit it as a highlight to orient everyone that doesn't necessarily know all the details of that. Um, an employee who usually works outside of New York State but occasionally comes into New York for work is likely exempt from New York's paid family leave. Um, if you had someone, for example, who works in offices on both sides of the state border, if you're either um, in the New York City metro area or somewhere else in the state and have, for example, someone who crosses over from Massachusetts or Pennsylvania, to come into work on a fairly regular basis, then you would want to look more carefully as to whether that person should be covered. But someone who generally works in another state but occasionally visits a New York City office or an upstate New York facility um, probably doesn't need to be covered and doesn't gain entitlement to use the benefits. And again, the last possible scenario is a scenario where someone has employees who live in New York State but work outside of New York State. So you could, for example, be a Pennsylvania-based company um, and have an employee who lives on the other side of the border in New York, and they just report to work every day at your facility in northern Pennsylvania um, just because they live in New York State does not entitle them to uh, New York paid family leave benefits. If on the other hand, you again are the Pennsylvania company and hire someone who works in New York, who lives in New York state and works from home uh, primarily, um, let's say for example, more than 30 days in a calendar year, then at that point you may be obligated to cover them with New York paid family leave benefits. Um, this probably doesn't apply to any of the organizations where you work. This domestic worker coverage is something that was amended last year. We're going to talk about one or two other things that were amended for 2023, but 2022 introduced coverage for certain domestic workers hired by a private homeowner. So if by chance any of you are in that situation or work with others who are in this situation, um, I just wanted to point this change out. Um, so domestic workers who work 20 or more hours in a week for a private homeowner are eligible to be covered after 26 consecutive weeks. So there are various examples of this, nannies and house cleaners and other caretakers. Um, some of these types of individuals might be private companies that already provide their own coverages. So that doesn't necessarily implicate this, but if you hire someone directly personally to come work in your house for more than 20 hours a week, you may be subject to providing paid family leave. The last sort of important coverage issue is the concept of waivers. So basically, I, I talked about it will take 26 weeks or 175 days worked for an employee to be eligible to use paid family leave. That's a little bit different question 
from who has to contribute to paid family leave insurance. So normally you hire an employee, let's say full time, who's expected to work 40 or so hours a week indefinitely throughout their employment. From day one of their employment, you can take their contribution for paid family leave insurance out of their pay, even though they won't be eligible to use paid family leave um, unless and until they remain employed for six months. Um, there is the possibility for some employees to waive coverage, which would mean that they don't get that portion of the paid family leave premium deducted from their pay. Uh, I, I guess I didn't mention clearly, but just to make make it clear, the um, benefits are paid by the insurance company and the insurance companies charge premiums, but employers are entitled to deduct the full premiums from their employees pay. So it's supposed to be an employee paid system, even though technically the employer is paying the the premiums, the insurance company is paying the benefits and the employees are paying the employer for the coverage. But there's no additional premium beyond what is contributed by employees. Anyway, so there is some reason why employees wouldn't necessarily want to be in the program, uh, but they can only waive coverage if they will not meet the minimum time requirements. It doesn't mean they have not yet met it. It means they will not meet it. How does this work? The typical situation is someone who is hired specifically for a limited duration that will not reach six months or 175 days, depending on the schedule that they work. Uh, if you hire an intern or someone to work over the summer or just for a holiday break or some other specific short-term period, then the company needs to offer those people the opportunity to waive coverage. And if they then waive coverage, they will not make contributions and won't be eligible for paid family leave benefits. If they choose not to waive coverage for whatever reason, practically that would mean that they would be subject to having the premium contributions taken out of their pay, even though they will likely nonetheless not become eligible for paid family leave benefits. Yes, yeah, so there's a question and, and again, to confirm, you start pay, the employees start paying for paid family leave or at least the employer has the right to start taking the deduction for paid family leave coverage out of the employee's pay immediately, even though it would be six months before the employee is entitled to participate. Again, it's an insurance program. So the point is that people are paying in, even if they're not receiving, and even if they're not eligible yet to receive the benefits. In the case where an employee has waived coverage, assuming they were able to, because circumstances suggested they would never become covered, but something changes such that they will now meet the minimum eligibility requirements, the waiver will be automatically deemed revoked. Again, um, the way this works is if now you thought someone was only working for the summer, but you've extended their employment to be permanent or indefinite anyway, at that point in time, even though they have not yet worked six months now that the expectation is that they will work six months or may work six months at that point in time they now uh, are no longer deemed to have waived coverage so again the contributions can start being made even though they're not yet eligible immediately to take paid family leave um, employees may revoke a waiver at any time. So why I say qualified employees here, I mean, assuming they're still eligible for a waiver, but for some reason decide they want to revoke it, they have that right. It's not clear why anyone in that situation would, because again, the expectation would still have to be that they're never going to be eligible for the benefits. 
and again, I've, I've answered this a couple of times. Yes, if the waiver is revoked, the employer may begin taking payroll deductions and moreover can go back and make deductions retroactive from the date of hire. So whatever the appropriate contribution deduction would have been, um, say even over the last two or three months, can now be taken out once the waiver is revoked, either uh, deliberately by the employee or just because a schedule change means that they're no longer eligible for waiver revocation. Now, um, before I go too much further into circumstances, we're going to come back a little bit to the contribution component of this. Just I'm going to explain to you what the contribution is and again, show you how the contribution rates have changed over the last five or six years. Uh, but it, it is worth noting that we're talking about what the law allows. Not every employer is actually taking this money out of employees pay and not legally obligated to. Generally, um, employers can choose to just pay this premium without recouping the money from their employees. Um, and again, in that last example, maybe not all employees are actually going back and taking retroactive contributions, but you know the law does allow those things, at least assuming you haven't negotiated something or agreed something different with employees, uh, such as through bargaining with a union. Circumstances, just wanted to refresh everyone's recollection relatively quickly on what circumstances qualify for paid family leave. And this is an area where there is a, a recent amendment that took effect January 1st of 2023. Although a relatively minor, at least on paper amendment, it could have relatively significant uh, impact on people's availability to take paid family leave. Generally speaking, these qualifying circumstances are familiar, birth, adoption, um, foster care placement of a child. Employees can take leave within 12 months of the date of birth, adoption, or foster placement. This is a leave that has been, um, I don't even want to say controversial, but um, a, a big change for employers over the past several years because this leave can be taken intermittently, unlike under the Family Medical Leave Act. So not only is it paid leave, um, and it's still 12 weeks of leave like the FMLA, but employees can choose to take it, you know, a day at a time over the course of the 12 months after the birth adoption or placement for foster care. Um, and it's generally um, difficult to put many limitations on when and how the employees choose to use that leave. So again, under the FMLA, they had the right to take 12 weeks under these circumstances of unpaid leave, but employer didn't have to allow it to be taken intermittently for those purposes. Um, paid family leave covers caring for a family member with a serious health condition. Uh, that's similar to the FMLA. The big difference here is that there is no leave available under paid family leave for the employee's own serious health condition. I think the primary logic behind that is that there's already short-term disability in New York State. Um, of course, the practical implication is significant because the New York State short-term disability benefit is significantly lower than the paid family leave benefit. It does last longer for up to 26 weeks, but even still the amount of wage replacement um, is so much lower that some employees will make more in 12 weeks of paid family leave than they would in 26 weeks of disability. Uh, qualifying circumstances related to military service are similar to the FMLA. Specifically, there are qualifying exigencies that entitle someone to FMLA leave, and those exact same qualifying circumstances are recognized under paid family leave. 
There was during COVID an amendment to make it clear that employees could use paid family leave in some situations where they or their minor child is under an order of quarantine or isolation due to COVID-19. Those provisions still apply, although obviously they're less prevalent than they were before. There are still the statute that requires um, employers to provide leave and in many cases paid leave for employees who are under an order of quarantine or isolation due to COVID-19. Um, in some cases that provides the full wage replacement. So there's no need to worry about paid family leave, but there are circumstances where employees could apply for paid family leave um, related to COVID. Obviously, there's not much of a distinction if what they're doing is caring for a family member who has COVID, but especially if there's a quarantine order that doesn't necessarily correspond to a positive test, which I'm not sure that those still actually happen, but there could have been a situation that otherwise wouldn't have been covered by paid family leave, and the legislature wanted to make sure that that was covered, especially during the COVID pandemic. Now, here's where we actually have a expansion of coverage. The covered family members for all the various purposes, uh, primarily including the medical condition or the military issues um, are listed here. The spouse, domestic partner, child, stepchild, parent, step-parent, parent-in-law, grandparent, or grandchild of the employee has always been a covered family member. Just this year, siblings are now added as well. There's no specific um, limitation on siblings, so it doesn't matter if the sibling lives in the same home as the employee or even in the same town, city, state, what have you. Um, doesn't matter the age of the sibling, doesn't have to be a minor sibling, for example. Um, so it certainly is plausible that employees will take leave that they couldn't have otherwise taken now um, to care for a sibling. So you need to be aware of that and you should update your policies to reflect siblings so that you don't face a situation where an employee says, well, I looked at your policy and I didn't know I had the right to take this leave um, to care for my brother or sister. Uh, to, to just this information is in here and I'm gonna dwell on it, very similar to the FMLA as to what a serious health condition is defined to include certainly an inpatient care situation in a hospital or hospice or other residential care facility would include a serious would be a serious health condition and the other category like the FMLA is continuing treatment. Here are some of the circumstances that qualify for continuing treatment and basically there's some form of medical treatment and it results in inability to work due to an injury or illness for more than three consecutive days. But there's also chronic conditions and long-term ongoing treatment that would qualify as well. Talked about the military families and, and I might have overstated something, so I'm, I'm gonna clarify now. This applies to an employee uh, and their an employee's spouse, domestic partner, child, or parent being in active duty in a foreign country or being notified of an impending call or order of active service. So this still does not include siblings or grandparents or grandchildren. It's limited to spouses, domestic partners, children, and parents. The uh, paid family leave law does not cover an employee's own military event. So if your employee is being deployed, then this wouldn't apply. In that case, they might have other rights for military leave under the federal USERA statute, for example. But um, the point here is that 
if there is something that needs to be dealt with related to a spouse, domestic partner, child, or parent being called to active duty, the employee can use paid family leave for that. There is under the FMLA a list of qualifying exigencies and the state paid family leave law adopts those by reference. And this is the list of certain qualifying military exigencies under the paid, paid fam, I'm, I'm sorry, the fa Family and Medical Leave Act, as well as then the New York Paid Family Leave Law. But both also recognize that there could be other circumstances that qualify as exigencies that would permit um, paid family leave. Just, you know, a question of how broadly you interpret these listed categories as to whether there even needs to be something else considered. But the idea is, again, if someone is being deployed and their uh, spouse, child, or parent who works for you needs to deal with something related to that, they are probably eligible for paid family leave, assuming they haven't otherwise used it up and they have worked long enough to be subject to the program in the first place. <laughs> Okay, now I have a category that I've just generally referred to as administration. This is going to address some of the logistical issues related to uh, applying for and receiving benefits. But we're going to start briefly with that employee contribution that I mentioned, just because I wanted to make sure you are aware of those numbers. This is a percentage of gross wages per pay period with an annualized cap. So for 2023, employees may contribute for, uh, yeah, 0.455%. Uh, so a little less than half of a percent of their wages per pay period up to the annual maximum of $399.43. The way this works, again, the employer is going to make a deduction from the employee's paycheck. You can deduct up to 0.455% of their total pay from each pay period until you have deducted $399.43 for the year, at which point you may deduct no more. You don't have to allocate the deductions over the course of the whole year. Um, in consideration of the cap, hypothetically, if someone made enough money in one or two pay periods, you could deduct the entire three hundred ninety-nine dollars and forty-three cents in one or two the first one or two pay periods of the year. You just could then no longer make any deductions. As I mentioned, employers don't all take this deduction. Um, the employer generally is writing the check to the insurance company. And if the employer doesn't take the money from employees, then that just means that now becoming an employer paid benefit rather than an employee paid benefit. And the state law envisions it being an employee paid benefit, but does not have any particular objection if the employer pays. Um, as I did before with the benefit rates, I just want to show the contribution rate. This is the first year that the contribution rate has gone down. The reason the contribution rate has gone down is primarily because the last two years, the state applied a COVID premium because there was additional utilization related to the COVID pandemic. So there was a COVID premium of uh, I think it was 0.05%. So that's basically the whole difference between the number from the last two years to this year. So it, other than that, it looks like the system is kind of leveling out at this half of a percent rate or thereabouts. Um, obviously, it started much lower. Part of the reason it started much lower was uh, maximum benefits were lower, both on a percentage basis and because the average weekly wage was lower. Um, so this is subject to change every year. The state has to do calculations and set this rate, but this is a statewide rate. It doesn't matter which 
insurance company you get your paid family leave coverage from, this is the rate that is charged. Um, that then generates a maximum annual contribution of, as I said before, $399.43. Again, this is down almost $25 from last year, but still up considerably from what employees were having deducted in the first couple of years. So certainly the last uh, three years now, employees are probably noticing the deduction more than they would have been in years one and two. Notice requirements, always important, of course, for employment law compliance. If you have written materials that are distributed to employees, such as employee handbooks or policy manuals, you have to include your paid family leave policy in those materials. If there is no such handbook or regular distribution of employee policies, et cetera, you have the obligation to somehow provide that guidance to employees anyway that include things like how to request paid family leave and the benefits that are available. Um, as most of you hopefully know, New York law changed as of uh, late December to now require that any notices you have to provide to employees have to be given electronically as well as um, posted in the workplace. So there is a notice of compliance requirement, a uh, posting requirement under the paid family leave law it includes information on your insurance coverage and carrier and how to contact them. So that is something you should have from your insurance company. Uh, it needs to be posted. So presumably now that also has to be provided electronically to your employees, either um, on a company website that employees have access to or by emailing them. Assuming the employer has given the notices that it's required to generally about paid family leave, then employees can be expected to give at least 30 days advance notice of their intent to use paid family leave if the need to use it is foreseeable, such as if they have a surgery um, in the future or you know it's a planned birth or adoption of a child. But in cases where it's not foreseeable, similar to the FMLA, the employee needs to notify the employer as soon as possible. Employees are ultimately responsible for submitting their application for paid family leave benefits to the insurance carrier. Um, but that doesn't mean that they shouldn't get the information from the employer. If they raise it, the company should point them to or hand them one way or the other, the appropriate application that needs to be sent to the insurance company. There's a portion of those documents that needs to be completed by the employer within a timely manner. And then at that point, the employee has to submit it to the insurance company. Um, ultimately, and here's a unique aspect of this process compared to the FMLA in particular, the insurance carrier, not the employer, determines benefit eligibility. That is similar to disability benefits, for example. The big distinction here and the kind of potential complexity is that New York State disability benefit technically isn't a leave eligibility event. Um, while for various reasons, it's often not a good idea to separate someone from employment while they're on disability. Um, technically, you can do that because they're not guaranteed leave. They're only entitled to the benefits. And likewise, when you do separate someone on disability from employment, that doesn't necessarily prevent them from continuing to get the disability leave benefit. Of course, paid family leave is both a benefit and a leave statute. So the employer has to allow the employees to take the leave where the insurance company has to pay the benefit. But 
the employer won't always know whether the insurance company is going to approve the benefit until after the leave begins because the insurance company has 18 days from receipt of the request or the first day of leave, whichever is later. So even if the employee gives you know, months worth of notice, technically an insurance carrier has 18 days after the leave began to decide whether or not they're going to get paid family leave benefits. I'm not sure that it's that much of a hassle um, in most of those such situations. Obviously, the non-foreseeable last minute application is more likely to create this issue, but effectively an employer is going to have to make a independent determination of whether this person is eligible for at least some form of leave, whether it be FMLA leave or paid family leave, to determine whether they're going to let them be out of work without penalty pending any outcome from the insurance carrier. If the employee is denied benefits, they can appeal that determination all the way up through an arbitration process. And again, this is really employee against insurance carrier. The employer's role is on the sidelines, um, but you have a material interest because this person is either coming or not coming to work and potentially whether they're getting benefits or not could affect what other forms of paid leave they're receiving or not receiving. So there are certainly circumstances where this becomes complicated. Uh, most of the time, the best thing the employer can do is communicate with the insurance carrier to try to determine as quickly as possible what the outcome is going to be on the benefit claim. There are a couple other issues on that that are gonna pop up in this last section. So the last thing I wanna cover is how paid family leave interacts with the um, paid family leave program. So again, the big obvious one is FMLA, which I've talked about many times already. The Federal Family and Medical Leave Act provides job protected unpaid leave for employees for qualified medical and family reasons. The real only distinction between when you can take FMLA leave and uh, when you can take paid family leave again is the employee's own serious health condition, which is an FMLA event, but not a paid family leave event. There are different eligibility requirements as far as how long you've been working, et cetera, for FMLA. And I'm going to show that in a minute. But again, once someone is eligible for both, employers can run that concurrently, paid family leave and New York paid family leave. And here's the important uh, note on that. If an employee is eligible for paid family leave, but doesn't apply for it, and the employer places them on FMLA leave because they're also eligible for that, the time that they're on FMLA leave and were eligible for paid family leave can be deducted from their paid family leave eligibility anyway, even though they won't receive the benefits. I think. If you think about it, obviously the point of this is the employee doesn't have the right to say, well, I only want to be on FMLA leave right now. For whatever reason, I don't want to use my paid family leave so that, for example, once my FMLA leave is over, I can then use paid family leave so I can get 24 weeks off instead of 12 weeks off. Okay, so let me... Let me try to break this down another situation. Employee is going to have surgery that is going to require them to be out of work for, let's say, two months or let's say four months. The employee notifies the employer in advance. The employer designates the leave as family medical leave as they're allowed to do. The employee doesn't have to request family medical leave under the FMLA, that is, the employer can say, well, your leave is going to be subject to the FMLA because you qualify for it. 
they designate the FMLA leave, give the paid family leave paperwork or information to the employee, but mm -hmm. the employee says, well, I don't want the paid family leave. And therefore they don't apply for it. Employer's not obligated or frankly really permitted to apply for the paid family leave for the employee. I mean, at least not against their wishes. But even if that happens, the employer can run the FMLA time and then, yeah, sorry, <laughs> somebody just made a good, good point, right? I said the employee's having surgery. Let, let's assume if the employee's spouse is having surgery, uh, right? Good catch. Employee spouse is having surgery, otherwise same conditions. So both both apply. I didn't want to use the birth example because that gets more complicated with disability. So that's why I was using a scheduled medical issue. So again, you run the FMLA leave, the employee doesn't apply for paid family leave. The time that they're on FMLA still runs their eligibility for weeks of paid family leave during that year. All right, here's the, a chart for you of the main differences between paid family leave and Family Medical Leave Act. The coverage is a big difference. Again, most all private employers and employees in New York are subject to the paid family leave program. FMLA, you have to have at least 50 employees before anyone would be eligible to take leave. The eligibility for the FMLA, you have to have worked for 12 months and you at any time have to have worked at least 1,250 hours in the 12 month period preceding the leave. The New York paid family leave doesn't have any hours of work requirement over the past year or any other time period. Once you've worked the 26 weeks or 175 days and become eligible, then you remain eligible throughout your employment for 12 weeks of leave per year. Again, as I um, temporarily messed up on that last point, um, employees cannot use paid family leave for their own serious health condition. Otherwise, they can essentially use both forms of leave for the same circumstances, um, except under the FMLA, caring for a child is limited usually to children under 18 years. That is not the case under paid family leave. You can use shorter increments of FMLA. You can only get paid family leave benefits in full day increments. Um, under the FMLA, you can require employees to use other paid time off. Because paid family leave is already a paid leave benefit, you cannot require employees to use other paid time off while on paid family leave. Come back to that in just a minute. A uh, couple of other obvious uh, leave interactions that I want to address, and then we'll start answering all the questions that are coming in. Um, Short-term disability is available, again, under New York law for non-work injuries or illnesses. Work-related illnesses and injuries would generally be covered by workers' comp law. So that's that distinction. Paid family leave doesn't replace disability benefits coverage. Again, if the employee is suffering their own serious health condition, then they're only going to be eligible for disability benefits, not paid family leave. The real place this interacts is with childbirth because employees who give birth to a child, meaning generally only the mother who gives birth to the child, can take both short-term disability under those circumstances and paid family leave. Obviously, the father can take paid family leave if eligible, but wouldn't have a disability benefits claim. So a woman who gives birth can choose how to use disability benefits and paid family leave, but the two cannot be taken at the same time. And where disability goes up to 26 weeks, employees who take both disability and paid family leave cannot take more than 26 total weeks in any 52 week or one year period. How does this work in practice? 
um, a woman could use disability for some period of time in connection with the actual birth of the child and then take paid family leave later on because that can be taken intermittently and not necessarily in connection to a medical event itself. So that way they can take more than 12 weeks of time and receive some wage replacement, again, recognizing that the short-term disability is a much lower um, wage supplement than the paid family leave. Workers' compensation insurance, again, provides cash benefits and can include medical care for workers who are injured or become ill as a result of their job. Employees that are collecting workers' compensation for a total disability cannot take paid family leave at the same time. At that point, they're assumed to be incapable of working due to their injury, so they're not uh, eligible to work in the first place, so they the logic is can't take paid family leave to um, excuse them from working in essence. But if the employee is just on a reduced earning schedule, they may still be eligible for paid family leave in addition to what they're receiving from workers' comp. Certainly, for example, if the employee is eligible to work generally, but is receiving workers' comp benefits that will cover their ongoing medical care, for example, that wouldn't prevent them from taking paid family leave. Um, we're down to two more quick topics. So if you have questions, go ahead and make sure you're getting them in. We'll answer them in about a couple of minutes. The um, parental leave policies that your company may have separate from the paid family leave or FMLA statutory requirements gives the company some discretion. You know, it's not uncommon for companies to pay more than 67% benefits that the paid family leave allows. Um, and because of the introduction of paid family leave, some companies are supplementing the 67% paid family leave benefit to maybe make the employee whole um, during the time that they are off on parental leave or at least the 12 weeks that would be covered by paid family leave. So you, again, you have discretion in what your policy says, obviously subject to not doing anything that the laws that are in place um, prohibit. Couple of uh, nuances, if the employee and their spouse have different employers, there's nothing stopping both of them from taking paid family leave at the same time. So your employee wants to take paid family leave and you know their spouse working for another company is taking paid family leave, that doesn't really change anything for your employee. If by chance both spouses work for the same company, um, the employer could decline to let them both take paid family leave at the same time, but you can't prevent them from each using their 12 weeks at separate times. So a birth of a child situation, the mother stays home for the first 12 weeks, for example, and then comes back to work and the uh, father then stays home for the next 12 weeks, or they split it up intermittently back and forth throughout the year. Um, the employer can't really do anything about that. They just can't require that, or they, they can't be required to have both employees out on paid family leave on the same days. Other leaves, again, really similar in most cases to the parental leave issue. The employers have some discretion, obviously, in what they said is their PTO and vacation policies. You can permit employees to supplement paid family leave with other forms of paid time off. Um, employees though cannot receive more than their full wages while receiving paid family leave benefits. So if someone is receiving uh, paid family leave, whatever else they're getting paid through some other form of paid time off can only get them up to their full regular wages. So that means they're probably not taking PTO in full day increments because that would put them over. They're taking it in some 
partial increment. But again, if your system allows for that, that's generally fine. If the employee wants to do it, there is an interaction with the FMLA here. If someone's on designated FMLA leave and they're receiving paid family leave benefits, the employer um, would be prohibited under the FMLA to require an employee to um, supplement with some other form of leave, but they probably couldn't do that under New York paid family leave law anyway. But under the FMLA, there's not a problem as long as the employee voluntarily is using another form of paid leave to supplement, which again, paid family leave does allow. Um, in the relatively recent past couple of years, we now are dealing as well with the New York paid sick leave law. It is possible that an employee would use paid sick leave at the same time as paid family leave, um, but it's relatively unlikely that that would happen um, for for a combination of reasons. Again, it could only be used for the employee's family member who's being cared for because they can't use paid family leave for their own medical condition. And again, they couldn't exceed full wage replacement, which paid sick leave provides. But, you know, there are situations where those two could interact. It's just not um, a very common occurrence. But if it happens, you just have to make sure, again, you're not violating any of the requirements or um, obligations of either of those New York statutory programs. All right, so I'm going to get to questions in just a moment. That um, is already a growing list in the chat window I can see, and I will stay on as long as I can. Just want to make everybody aware, if you're not already and haven't already registered, Starting next Friday, I am doing a program throughout the month of February, a very uh, in-depth and structured training on New York employment law for HR professionals. This is the first time we're offering a paid training program um, because we are going so in-depth. It is scheduled for two hours each Friday afternoon in February. Um, doesn't mean you necessarily have to be available during that two hour period. I will be giving the presentations and training sessions live. They will be recorded and there are materials that will be provided to you. If you miss any or even theoretically all of the sessions, you can still get all the benefits of the training program. If you're interested in that, you can get more information on my website at training.hortonplc.com. Okay, so here's my contact information. Again, I mentioned if you have a, a question that's too specific to be asked in this forum or you don't wanna ask it without um, attorney-client privilege or something like that, you can reach out that way. But I will start going down the list of the questions that I have received. Um, apologize if I answer them somewhat out of order in a sense, but do the best we can to make sure that all of them get answered. Um, there's a question, is an employee who works outside of New York State automatically excluded? Oh, real quick, I'm gonna put up the slides while I'm answering these questions. If you want the link to the slides, you can access those now. Uh, sorry. Uh, if the employee is working outside of New York State, presumably for a New York State-based company or a company that has otherwise these coverages, will they be automatically excluded from the New York short-term disability and paid family leave coverage, or can the employer include them? So that's ultimately a question for the insurance carrier. Um, and, and by that, I mean, certainly you can write down on paper that they're covered, the question is gonna be if they then make a claim, will the insurance carrier approve it? And they're probably not going to approve it generally if the employee never works in New York State. 
there are those issues where employees work in both New York State and outside of New York State. So those might be closer calls from a coverage issue. Um, there are certainly ways to get short-term disability insurance coverage for employees outside of New York State that would be different from the New York State required coverage. Um, but the other thing is these insurance carriers probably don't really love providing these coverages per se because they are statutory with set contribution limits. So they don't exactly get the charge market driven rates. The state tells them how much to pay for this. So they don't necessarily want to cover more people than they have to if we're being frank. But again, I haven't had that discussion with specific insurance carriers. So I can't guarantee you how that would turn out, but I wouldn't be making a broad assumption that you're going to get that coverage for employees with no um, footprint in New York State. Uh, question, I think we probably addressed this, but to be more specific on it, can an employee take 12 weeks of paid family leave and 12 weeks of FMLA totaling to 24 weeks of absence? Um, the answer is yes, it's certainly possible in the sense that, for example, someone could take paid family leave and then later become eligible for FMLA leave and which at which point they would then have 12 weeks of FMLA leave available to them. For example, you get paid family leave eligibility after six months if you're a full-time employee, but you wouldn't until after 12 months as an FMLA um, employee, covered employee. So there are some scenarios where someone at one point in time would only be eligible for one or the other, and that might net result in 24 weeks of absence in a year period. And again, there are situations that apply only to one or the other. So someone who is caring for their own medical condition couldn't take paid family leave, but if they then have a child later, they could take the paid family leave for that. But in the scenario where both would apply at the same time, the employee is eligible and has a qualifying circumstance under both programs, then generally speaking, the employer can and would run both simultaneously. They don't necessarily have to, um, but normally you would. Can paid family leave be denied if an employee does not give 30 days notice? For example, the employee knows they will be having surgery in 60 days and does not tell the employer until they need to be out of work. Well, the, the statute certainly suggests that that person should be denied paid family leave in that situation. Um, I mean, hypothetically, they might have an argument as to why they weren't sure that they were really gonna do the surgery. I don't know. The interesting part of all of that is, again, that it's ultimately the insurance company who's going to make the call on whether to approve or deny the paid family leave. If for whatever reason, under those facts, the insurance company approves the paid family leave, then the employer is obligated to then allow the person to be off for work as paid family leave during that time period. Um, again, you can have discussions with your insurance carrier and maybe provide them information for why you think the person isn't eligible for paid family leave, but it is their determination. But yes, I mean, consistent with the law, that person, um, presumably if it's that cut and dry, would not be eligible. Does the employee need to give the carrier 30 days notice or only the employer um, I'm pretty sure it's just the employer because at that point, the employer has to point the employee to the forms and then the employee has to fill out portions of the forms and then the employer has a few days to fill out its portion of the forms and then they need to be submitted. Um, I'm not 100% sure on the full time frame of all of that, but I don't think all of it has to be completed within 
the 30 days before the leave. Because again, the insurance carrier has up to 18 days after the leave begins in any instance to make the determination. For an employee taking paid family leave to bond with a child, can the employee take paid family leave several months after the child is born? Does the employee have to apply and be approved before the child is born? They need, they, they can take it up to 12 months after the child is born and they have to apply, presumably if the need, for leave is foreseeable 30 days before they're going to take the leave. So no, they don't necessarily have to apply before the child is born. They just have to apply at least 30 days before they're going to take the leave, assuming it's foreseeable. Theoretically, someone probably could say, well, I didn't know I was going to need to take this leave some months after the child was born. For example, a, cha a change in child coverage or something happens like that. So it then becomes um, an unforeseeable situation that the person now suddenly is going to have to take leave to bond with the child. But all else being equal, for example, employee has a child January 1st, they have until December 31st to take up to 12 weeks of paid family leave. Hypothetically, they could wait until October to start taking that 12 weeks and then take it the last three months of the year. And I think as long as in that situation, they gave notice at least 30 days before the first day of leave in October, um, then they would be eligible. I'm just looking to see what other questions are had. Oh, is there a specific document that needs to be physically posted or is it a copy of our policy? Well, your policy needs to be distributed to employees, but yes, there's a notice of compliance that you should receive from your insurance carrier for disability insurance and paid family leave insurance. And there's a similar notice for workers' compensation. So those are things that you should generally get from your insurance carrier. Um, I think they're generally updated annually. So you should check on that. I think some, some of the insurance carriers, they don't necessarily highlight it, but you can log in to your portal or make the request to get your updated compliance certificate. If an employee misses a full pay period, is it okay to deduct any employee paid benefits on the next pay period where they have been working? So I'm assuming this is asking about the paid family leave contribution. Um, the statute just says how much you can deduct per pay period. I think if there's a pay period where they're not paid anything, there's nothing that you can deduct. I don't think that you can then take a double deduction during the next pay period. I think in this case, pay period would probably be interpreted to mean a period in which they're actually paid. Um, I've never actually had to consider that situation, but that's my impression of what it most likely intends to mean. If there's a, a real specific issue about that, we'd have to look into it more carefully. For birth, does the employee have to wait until the child is born to submit the documents to insurance? Well, they certainly don't have to wait until the child is born to submit the documents. I mean, they can they can make the application, you know, if, if they want to take the leave beginning at the birth in particular, I mean, the insurance carrier might follow up and want updated information on when the birth occurs, for example. 
Uh, there's a question, a follow-up question on the one about the contributions and the pay period uh, for medical deductions. I, I'm not sure if you're just asking about health insurance or something else. So if you can clarify that, appreciate it. There, there's a question about domestic partner. There is a legal definition of domestic partner that would apply. So it's not merely significant other. It doesn't have to be any sort of licensed or registered domestic partner situation. Um, I don't know the definition of domestic partner under New York law under off the top of my head. I know that you can register domestic partnerships in New York, but it's not required that you do that to get paid family leave. I'm trying to look this up. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it depends on, you know, whether they're registered for insurance purposes um, and do they, can they show that they rely on each other for support? But yes, there, there are legal criteria, but formal legal registration of the partnership is not required. Um, health insurance deductions. So your health insurance deductions would generally be limited by what the employee has authorized by way of a deduction. So if the employee is authorized a deduction of whatever their contribution is, um, you, you'd have, you'd want to look at the wording of what was authorized just to be careful. But yeah, in, in that sense, typically, because you're having to pay for the insurance as they go, um, I think you could make the deductions as you suggested, the catch up contributions. The FMLA addresses that in situations where a person is out on FMLA leave and you're having to continue health insurance um, that way. And especially if they're not getting paid anything, there might not be anything to deduct from when they return and get back on the payroll. You can make catch up contributions there. Uh, there's some guidelines in place and we can't necessarily deduct all of it all at once. Uh, and ideally, you would work something out with the employee before they go out. You can address that in your um, Family Medical Leave Act policy or your paid family leave policy in more or less detail. All right, I think there might be one other question I wasn't clear on. Otherwise, I think I've addressed them all. Let me see if I can go back to the one. There was a question, someone is not covered under FMLA. Are there workers, are they protected while taking, I think this says TDI as they are while taking paid family leave. If, if you're still in here and could confirm for me what you mean by TDI, I'm assuming it's disability, but I'm not sure which type of disability insurance. But again, the, the short-term New York State statutory minimum disability requirement and generally any private disability insurance coverage is not going to be a leave entitlement per se. So someone, for example, might have the right to get up to 26 weeks of benefit under a short-term disability, yeah, short-term disability um, coverage that doesn't necessarily mean the employer has to retain them on their payroll for 26 weeks. What you can't do is um, terminate their employment because they're on disability. You can't retaliate against them for using disability. Um, but hypothetically, you know, you need to replace that position and you can't just keep this person with job restoration right. Um, you may be able to separate them um, 
subject to potential disability discrimination claims and obligations to provide reasonable accommodations under the New York Human Rights Law. But yes, your, your follow-up question is exactly right. Literally speaking, there's a key distinction between paid family leave and both disability and workers' compensation leave. They're all under the same chapter of New York law under what's called the workers' compensation leave, but only paid family leave formally applies a leave entitlement. Again, you have a lot of other issues to consider with people who have especially their own disability um, because you do have the disability discrimination laws as well. But the, the key distinction with the FMLA and paid family leave is it says employer must, generally speaking, keep your job open for 12 weeks and then you, know, you have the right to come back to the same or substantially same position. Disability and workers comp just say that people are going to get paid during a certain time period. But again, as long as you don't terminate them for receiving or applying for or seeking those benefits, and if you are somehow not otherwise in violation of the disability discrimination laws, such as where you can say, look, it's an undue hardship for us to allow this person to remain out of work indefinitely or for an extended period of time, um, then then you could make um, a job action, you know, separate them from employment potentially. I mean, the, the final note on paid family leave and FMLA, it, despite the job protection, you could still lay off or terminate a person while they're on those leaves, you would just have to have a good reason to do it independent of the fact that they've taken paid family leave and or FMLA leave. So if you find out while someone is out on paid family leave that they have stolen money from the company, for example, you could presumably terminate their employment on that basis. They could hypothetically claim that they were denied their paid family leave or FMLA entitlement, but you know, presumably if you can prove that they stole money, that's a separate independent reason for terminating them. Well, likewise, an economic layoff where you lay off everyone or a substantial percentage of people in some department where that person would reasonably be included for reasons other than the fact that they were on leave Again, you should be able to do that. Okay, I don't think I have any other questions in here. If you have any others, then type it in. I'm still happy to answer it. Otherwise, thanks for all of you. Um, a good number of you have stayed on all this time through the questions. And I look forward to speaking with you again. If you are interested in that, um, pretty comprehensive employment law overview course. Um, I encourage you to take a look at that and sign up. Um, we'll still continue to do these webinars, these complimentary webinars um, as well. That's just a, a different opportunity um, for people who could benefit from it um, and have the time and resources to participate. Otherwise, thanks uh, a lot for joining us today. Hope this has been informative and helpful, and we look forward to seeing you next time.